higher than the mountain. Chastity, has it made a difference in your life? She looked at me and grinned from ear to ear. She says, yes. She says, I'm happier than I've ever been. Amen. And she, I said, are you excited about being baptized? She said, I've been excited for two weeks. <laughs> so we're excited with Chastity. Chastity, the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord 
believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you would be saved. What's your confession this morning? Jesus is my Lord. Amen. Amen. Jesus Amen. is Lord indeed. Upon your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ through baptism. Raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Praise the Lord. wonderful testimony we've witnessed this morning. Let me ask you today about your testimony. Is it true? Are you a child of God? Have you experienced believer's baptism? There's water. What keeps you from following the same pattern, the same footsteps that you've seen today? Father God, I thank you for what we've witnessed, and I thank you for what you're going to do today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. I think we need to start every service off like this, don't y'all? I sure do. Man, if you weren't here last week, we had a ball. We had fun, but we're going to have fun today, too. That's in the past. We're going to enjoy today. If you hadn't uh, gathered it by now, our topic today is the love of God. And uh, Shelby's going to lead this song for us. It's 157, The Love of God. Sing this part. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His every child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measure.
Daniel, Brian, would you come and serve as our ushers this morning, please?
Amen. Thank you, Sadie. That's beautiful. Wow. Wasn't the music great? All of that. Wow. How many of you know God loves you? Amen. God loves us, doesn't he? He does. Listen, I want to I invite you on a journey today. Now, it, I'm going to ask you to do something. I want to I ask you to paint a mental picture. And some of you are good at that. Some of you got an imagination that you can mag- magically just kind of take yourself back. Now, we're going to go back in time. And I want you to think about what we're going to do in, in terms of um, our perspective of time. We read the Bible, we read the Word of God, and, and we oftentimes find ourselves reading it simply as a history lesson of what has gone on the years before. But I'm here to tell you it's much more than history. It is part of our history, and, uh, but it's much more than that. If you stop and think about it, you know, Columbus discovered America when? 1492. How many years ago was that? bunch (laughs) well it's a bunch but it's not a bunch in comparison to where we're going today now think about it 1492 that's right at 1500 we're almost in we're in the year 2015 so we're 600 years 523 523 years ago okay Uh, you know I, I, I wasn't around were you around Barbara was, okay. <laughs> Five, oh, let's, 500 plus years ago, that's, you know, that, that's a stretch for us to, to go back. You stop and think about it in your lifetime, in my lifetime, the things that have changed around us. Our world has literally transformed. And in the next 20 years, it'll have transformed again and again and again. Well, this morning, I want us to go back some 3,500 years. Think you can go back there with me? 3,500 years ago. We're going back to the time of Moses and the children of Israel finding themselves in Egypt. Now think about it. There were, the Bible tells us that there were 600,000 men plus women and children. It's interesting, they didn't take time to give us the total number of women and children, but it's, that's a lot of people, 600. 100,000 men plus women and children were there in Egypt. They'd been there quite a while. The Bible tells us, all, it tells us exactly how long they were there, believe it or not. They were held captive in Egypt 430 years to the day. To the day. The end of the 430th year was when God delivered them through Moses, and it was, uh, you remember the stories, don't you? Don't you remember the stories of, of what Moses going before Pharaoh and, and God telling Moses, go and tell him to let my children go, and Moses would go and tell him, and, and God would harden Pharaoh's heart, and, and they would, there was this battle going on, there were the plagues that, that, that God brought on the land of Egypt, and, and uh, time and time again, Pharaoh would would consent and say, okay, you can go, and then he would relent and come back and say, no, you can't. 600,000 men plus women and children, 430 years of being slaves. You remember one of the, one of the things, the results of all of uh, the efforts that Moses made with Pharaoh, Pharaoh told a Moses, he said uh, that uh, he said because of what's going on, he said now y'all got to make the I want the, the slaves, the Israelites, to make brick, but they got to make it without straw. So that whole episode of leading up to the time where Moses and God led them out of Egypt, uh, there were hardships that were brought on. They were slaves. They were slaves to fear. They were slaves to the Egyptians. They were slaves to all that was around them. And then here came the day that God brought them out. Pharaoh had had enough. He'd lost his firstborn son. And he tells Moses, go ahead and take them. Take them. Leave. (laughs) It was interesting. 
They took off, but you know what happened? God showed them favor in their leaving, didn't he? God showed them favor because what happened was he caused the, the Egyptians <laughs> to pour out a blessing on them as they left. He said that when they leave, they're going to be giving you gold, they're going to be giving you clothes, they're going to be giving you stuff to help you on your journey. It must have been an incredible time. Now, here's what I want you to do with me this morning. I want you to mentally go back there, and everybody in this room, we don't have 600,000 people here this morning, but that's okay. You're one of 600,000 this morning. Can you do that? Can you go back with me and just kind of think about what was going on during that season, during that moment, during that release as they left Egypt? And uh, as people came out and ushered them down the street and handed them money and handed them clothing and, and uh, said, y'all have a good trip. Maybe not that. But here they are, here we are, and we're leaving Egypt. Are you with me? You ready to leave Egypt? Amen. Some of you sitting there going, I kind of like it here. I'm not sure I want to go. What's he going to do? Take me out, walk me around the parking lot? We're, going to, we're leaving Egypt. And you know what God does? God, God doesn't take them straight to where he's told them they were going to go. Remember, God told them there was this land that flowed with milk and honey. There was this promised land that he was sending them to. And God doesn't allow them to go straight there because if they had gone straight there, they'd have gone through the Philistine camp. And here was God's reasoning. He said, you know, if I, I send them the short way, which was a, really a three-day journey, if I send them the short way and send them through the Philistine camp, the Philistines might attack the children of Israel. And, and you know, I don't know that they're prepared for that. I don't know that, you know, they're, they, they are an army in a sense. But yet, for 430 years, they've been told that they were nothing but slaves. They've been put down. They've been used. And for 430 years, they have lived in a state of desperate need. And to be able to fight a, a battle, let alone win a war against the Philistines, God said, no, we're not going to go there. We're going to go, I'm going to take them through the wilderness. So we're on our wilderness journey, you and I. And we uh, take off, and word comes back to us that uh, Pharaoh changed his mind. And Pharaoh set out with his, the best of the chariots that he had in his army along with others and they took off after us. And they came and they chased us into the wilderness. And where did we end up? Where are we today? Where are we? We're at the Red Sea. We're at the Red Sea. But God does something, you know. And there's... This guy Moses, you know, this guy Moses that's, that's our leader? You know, you know I, I wondered about him back when all this stuff was going on when he was approaching Pharaoh, and I, was, I, I, was, I, didn't, I didn't have a lot of confidence in him, but, but you know, he stood up there and uh, stuck his hands up in the air, and, and all of a sudden the Red Sea just split wide open. And we walked through. Now we're on the other side of the Red Sea. It's the morning after. It's the morning after we've camped out on the other side of the Red Sea. And here we are. Whew. Man, I don't know about you. I didn't sleep a wink last night. I didn't. I didn't sleep at all. I just couldn't get over all that happened. Did you see it? Did you see what happened? Did you see Moses? That man Moses, he knows something. He knows somebody. He stood up and raised his hands above the sea, and the sea parted. You remember the wind? The wind that came out of the east and blew all night long. The walls of water that were stacked up on each side, and the wind blew the muddy ground where the water had been, and it dried it out. Oh, I was amazed. I was amazed. Uh, 
oh, it looks like we're, we're headed out. We're going to, well, I, I don't want I don't to get lost. I don't want to stay behind. But I, I, I can't get over it. You know, we were slaves. But now we're free. This is our, really our, our first ex- experience as being free people. And here we go. We're, we're on this journey. Boy, it's a little hot. And, uh, but I, I still can't get beyond what had happened. It was incredible. Did you see, do you remember, did you see when the chariots rode in behind us? Did you see that the, wa- the walls of water, after we had all gotten out on the other side, the walls of water, they collapsed down on those, uh, on those chariots and those horses and those Egyptians. It sure seems a little hot, a little unusual. But, man, I just, I just can't get beyond it. Moses knew what he was doing. He was really, really, really in charge. That was, that was fantastic. Man, I'm going to keep going on because I'm, 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 I'm getting behind. Man, it's getting a little hot. But, yeah, I still can't get beyond it. It's just been incredible. It's been incredible to experience all of what we've seen and what we've... Did you, hey, do you all remember seeing that the clouds of dust... That, that led the way during the day, and it turned to a, a pillar of fire at night, and it, and it guided us. And do you, know, you remember when we got to the Red Sea, and we got there, and, 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 and that, that, that cloud of dust that was in front of us moved behind us and turned to a pillar of fire and kept the Egyptians at bay until we could all get across that Red Sea. Man, it's hot. Man, it looks, I, I think we're getting to a camp. I think we're going to camp here. Well, I'm, I, I, mean, I didn't sleep last night. I, I bet I sleep like a baby tonight. I, I'm excited about, about camping out. I, I'm ready to rest. Man, it's hot. It's hot. Well, how'd y'all sleep last night? Well, I slept like a rock. I was out like a light when I laid my head down on that stone pillow that I found. Man, I was gone. Y'all notice that we're kind of walking in the desert? Man, it's hot. I wonder where we're going today. This is, this is, a, this is, this is turning out a lot different than what I thought it was. You know, it's, y'all, have y'all felt the heat? It's, it's rather warm. and I, I'm not sure, but, you know, today's, I'm trying to think about the day before. It was pretty good, you know, but, but today, this is just all I see is just more sand and more dirt and more dust and about 599,000 men way out in front of me because I'm way behind. And all those women and children, all those animals, you know, they, they you know, I don't know about you, but the, the, the warmer it gets, the more they smell. It's getting kind of bad, and, It's kind of hot. It's kind of hot. But you know, I think I see this oasis up there. I think I see this oasis. Maybe, maybe that's where we can get some water. Maybe, maybe that's what it'll, 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 it'll be. It'll be better. It'll be better when we get to the oasis. Well, here we are. We're here. Ooh, I'm tired. It's been a long walk. You know, that water ain't better. That water is bitter. You know, come to think of it, who is this Moses guy? Who is he? You know, what's he doing? Why, why did he lead us here? Why are we here? I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. When are we going to get there? Why aren't we there yet? Man, I can't believe that we have followed. This guy Moses. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. Verse 22. 
Then Moses led the people of Israel away from the Red Sea. They moved out into the desert of Shur. They traveled in this desert for three days without finding any water. When they came to the oasis of Mara, the water was too bitter to drink. So they called the place Mara, which means bitter. Then the people complained and turned against Moses. What are we going to drink? They demanded. So Moses cried out to the Lord for help. And the Lord showed him a tree. Moses threw it into the water, and this made the water good to drink. It was there at Mara that the Lord set before them the following decree as a standard to test their faithfulness to him. He said, if you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, obeying his commands and keeping all his decrees, then I will not make you suffer any of the diseases I sent on the Egyptians. For I am Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord who heals you. After leaving Mara, the Israelites traveled on in the oasis to the oasis of Elam, where they found 12 springs and 70 palm trees. They camped there beside the water. Now, our little journey that took us to Mara, can you imagine what the children of Israel went through? And you know, the truth is that when they got there after, just after three days of freedom. <laughs> Egypt didn't sound quite as bad as they remembered it to be. They complained. You see, the Israelites were caught up in themselves in their immediate need and circumstances. You say, well, Brother Joe, you know, think about it. They were thirsty. They were hungry. Yeah, that's an immediate need. and They were looking at their circumstances around them and not holding fast to what they had just experienced and what they had just seen and what they had just tasted and what God had done for them. Yeah, they complained, all right. They complained because they were not looking back at what God had done. They were not looking forward to the promise of what God had said about a promised land that had been rumored had been talked about for so long, had been promised, all they were focused on was the now. Have you ever been there? Where you can't see beyond the now. The now has got you so consumed, it hits you like a, a ton of bricks. You get news, bad news, news that is unsettling, and that spirit of fear or anxiety or grief or sadness or whatever it is that has caused you to stop in your tracks and forget what God has done in your past and forget what God has promised in your future and begin just looking at what you're standing in and what you're facing in this moment. I think we all have. You see, Israel complained. Israel forgot. You see, they'd forgotten all they'd seen. They'd forgotten all they experienced. They'd forgotten the hand of God that had literally delivered them out from the bondage of slavery. All they could think about was the bitter water, the bitterness from within. You see, there's a bigger lesson here. The bitterness of water was representative of a bitterness within from all that they thought they had left behind. You see, circumstances oftentimes has a way of blinding us. When the difficulties come, when the bad news hits us, we oftentimes lose sight of what God has in store for us. And that's exactly what happened to Israel. 
See, the lesson was much bigger than with Israel than undrinkable water. And there's a lesson for us as well. I thought it was interesting when the children of Israel, the scripture tells us the children of Israel went to Moses and complained to Moses and cried out to Moses that they were, they were literally dying of thirst. You know, why are we here? What's going on? And, you know, what did, what did, what's the scripture say that Moses did? He turned to, he, he, he listened to him, he turned to God. He said, he said, why? You know, he cried out to God. And what did God say? God showed him a tree. My version actually, I, 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 took, I, I melded two versions together. The New King James Version, the King James Version says tree. The New Living uh, Translation says that God showed him a piece of wood. But basically, God did show him a tree. And he took the tree that God showed him and he threw it in the water. And he made it sweet. He took away the bitterness he took away the bitterness. You see, God used the tree to remove bitterness in the water. And then God declares himself to the children of Israel as Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah Rapha. You see, there are a number of different descriptive names that we find in the Old Testament in Hebrew, that are descriptive of the character of who God is. Now, you understand I said who God is, not who God was. Because the same Jehovah Rapha who declared himself to be their healer is the same Jehovah Rapha that declares that to us today. He declared himself as their healer under conditions, didn't he? He said, if. If, if you listen to God's voice, is what he said. He says, if you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord, your God. How well do you listen? <laughs> now, I know none of you had children that had selective, selective hearing, but I, I, I had one or two of our three. I'm not going to name names. They were male. And it was the eldest, that's all I can say. But he had selective hearing. Well, <laughs> he actually <laughs> had selective, but he was also deaf in his left ear. <laughs> he was literally deaf in his left ear from a car, wreck, a car, a car that hit him. But he, he did, you know, we, and we do that. I, 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 I think you've probably seen that before. Maybe, you know, we've done that before. You ever had some hear somebody call out your name and you stop and you think, oh, I don't know if I want to stop and talk or if I want to keep going or and then they call it the second time, oh I gotta I gotta talk. I gotta hear. We can become selective in our hearing. God says, if you listen to the voice of God, I'm telling you, God's voice is very clear. It's very clear. It's just as clear to you. As, as, as I'm speaking to you, God can speak to you in that same manner. You say, well, God speaks audibly. God speaks through his word. God speaks through his word. God speaks through his children. God speaks through circumstances as well. But we've got to be in tune with his voice. We've got to practice listening to his voice so that when he does speak, we can, we can, we can say, yes, Lord, I'm ready. Instead of wondering, what was that? What was that? Who said what? He said what? God speaks, and one of the conditions of God declaring himself being our healer is that we must listen to his voice. And then the other condition that's stated here in Scripture says, and do what is right in his sight. Do what is right in his sight. I've shared with you my definition on multiple times before of what sin is. And sin is anything that we think, do, or say. Think, do, or say that doesn't please God. When we find ourselves in the midst of sin, then we are outside of what God is speaking here when he says, 
and do what is right in his sight. So we're called to listen to God's voice. We're called to do what is right in his sight. And we're also told here that we need to obey his commands. Obeying his commands and keeping his decrees. And that's kind of part of doing right what's in his, doing right in his sight. And then, if, if we comply and we meet the if, then God comes back and says what? He says, then they will not suffer. He told the Israelites, he said, you will not suffer any of the diseases I sent on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. And here's, when I studied this and began studying this, I think, I felt like God was showing me that the process of healing, God was walking them through that as, as he began walking them through the wilderness. You see, they experienced, they had to experience some joy and celebration in leaving Egypt. They were finally free. And to see that God had moved the Egyptians to, to bless them and to give them the gifts and, and the treasures uh, as they went on their way, they had to have had that, that, that joyous celebration of, of walking out of Egypt those first few days. And then reality hit. But you see, I think all of that was a process of helping them understand what it meant for God to be their healer. And then they come to Mara, bitter waters. You know, there, there are times where we experience those things in our life, right? Where there's, you can use the word bitter or you can use the word... <laughs> You can use finding yourself where you don't want to be. Just that, you know, that's, they didn't want to be in Mara because it didn't provide for their needs. It wasn't meeting their, their physical needs. But you know what? Where did God take them from there? He took them to Elam, another oasis a few miles down the road. And what was at Elam? It says that there were 12 springs of water and 75 palm trees. You see, I, I, I look at Elam, and I see Elam as a place of rest, a place of comfort, a place of peace, a place of provision, but more than anything, a place where they can truly experience the presence of God. You see, God used a tree to move them on to a greater blessing. God used a tree to take them from the bitterness of where they were in Mara to get them directed toward Elam. That's what he did for Israel. And I want to remind you this morning that God also used a tree for you and me. He did. He used a tree for you and me that we could move beyond bitterness of sin that would separate us from literally from the present, very presence of God. I think it's in Acts chapter 5, verse 30. It says this. It says, The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on a tree. You see, the cross is a symbol of that sacrifice made by Christ to a Remove that bitterness of sin so that we can enjoy and celebrate and worship in the very presence of God Himself. You see, God used a tree in the life of the Israelites and God used a tree for you and I. You see, He's still our deliverer. He's still our deliverer from slavery. He's still our deliverer through the red seas of life. Think about it. The children of Israel were led through the wilderness and they came to what would appear a lost cause. There's water before them, there's desert and an army behind them, and there's no place to go. God parted the sea. Some of you are here today, 
and you're standing in front of the biggest sea that you've ever seen in your life. It may be a sea of fear. It may be a sea of sorrow. It may be a sea of grief. It may be a sea of, of financial havoc in your life. It may be a sea of broken relationships. And you don't know where to go, and you don't know what to do. I'm here to tell you today that the same God that parted the sea for the children of Israel can part the sea that you stand before in your life. And God can walk you through on dry ground. I found a song yesterday that uh, I'd never heard before. I'd never heard the uh, husband and wife group that, that, that performed it, but when I went back and heard it and listened to it and watched the video and I, I, it's, I put the word, I had, it, you looked at the video that had the words on it, I, it just, it, it, it melted my heart because it reminded me of where I've been and where I am today. So I want you to watch this. Ashley, go ahead. God wants to liberate you today. Whatever's holding you captive, whatever's got you bound, God wants to set you free. Whatever you're standing, whatever sea you're standing in front of, God wants to split it so you can walk right through it today. You see, He leaves it in your hands. God wants to bring healing to your life. First and foremost, God wants to bring spiritual healing. He wants to put in order that which may be out of order in your life so that you can have a right relationship with God the Father. I'm telling you, that's the ultimate freedom. There's nothing else like it in all the world. I invite you today to step out in faith and to declare what you've heard sung this morning, that I am a child of God. I'm walking in freedom today. I'm walking through the sea that God has split wide open so that I can walk away from whatever is holding me captive. Father God, do your work today. Be real today, Lord Jesus, in such a way that you draw people to yourself. Father, set free those who are held captive from sin. Set free those who are held captive are slaves to fear. Set free those who are slaves to grief and worry and circumstance, Father, and let them know that you are Jehovah Rapha to them today. You are the Lord that heals. So God, move today challenge us to be obedient. Help us to hear your voice. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand? Page 488.